Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 73, Space Shuttle Flight 6, STS-6. A Challenger Appears. Last time, we talked about the first operational mission of the Space Shuttle, STS-5. The flight successfully performed the first two satellite deployments of the shuttle program, SBS-3 and Annex C, successfully carried the first mission specialists in addition to a commander and pilot, and, well, unsuccessfully attempted the shuttle's first spacewalk. Can't win them all, I guess. In a lot of ways, this was an unremarkable flight. But with its new crew paradigm, commercial payloads, and lack of pressure suits during launch and landing, it truly marked the dawn of the shuttle era. And after five consecutive space flights, Columbia was rolled into the orbiter processing facility for a well-earned maintenance and upgrade break. To pick up the slack while Columbia was in the shop, NASA introduced one of my favorite orbiters. Spoiler alert, they're all sort of my favorite. Rolling out to Launch Complex 39A for the first time would be Space Shuttle Challenger. With Enterprise being designated OV-101 and Columbia being designated OV-102, you might be expecting Challenger to be designated OV-103. But you'd be expecting wrong. And that's because Challenger, which was actually designated OV-099, followed a bit of a different path than the rest of the orbiter fleet. In fact, as indicated by the zero at the start of its designation, it was never meant to fly in space at all. Static Test Article 099 was created because simulating spaceships is hard. With so many parts being subjected to such intense forces and an unusually slim margin for error, testing that the orbiter was up to the task was extremely difficult. Even with today's computers, this would be quite a task. But in the 1970s, it was essentially impossible. So instead, NASA ordered STA-099. This was basically a stripped-down shuttle that was subjected to a year-long torturous test campaign. The vehicle was vibrated to ensure that it could withstand the forces encountered on ascent. It was pressed on by hundreds of high-pressure hydraulic jacks to ensure that it could withstand the forces encountered on re-entry. It was poked, prodded, heated, bent, and broken, all to ensure that when it came time to fly, NASA could do so with confidence. STA-099's fortunes changed in the late 1970s when engineers looked at the work required to retrofit Space Shuttle Enterprise to be spaceworthy. NASA's first orbiter was built early in order to accommodate the approach and landing tests. As a result of that, by the time these spaceworthy orbiters were being built, the design had been changed significantly, so getting Enterprise into orbit would have been a difficult and expensive task. Instead, why not just retrofit STA-099? Enterprise would have to be torn down and rebuilt in order to fly. But STA-099 was already torn down. It would only need to be rebuilt. So, in early 1979, engineers got to work on the extensive, but not quite as extensive as Enterprise, modifications that would be required to get Challenger spaceworthy. Redesignated OV-099, Challenger was rolled out of the Rockwell plant in Palmdale, California in June of 1982 and arrived at the Kennedy Space Center on July 5th of the same year. 125 years before Challenger's first flight, its namesake set sail for the first time. The HMS Challenger was notable for a scientific expedition in which it sailed over 130,000 kilometers in four years. The modern-day Challenger, with a somewhat better propulsion system, would travel that distance in a little over five hours. Flying STS-6 would be the second four-person crew for the space shuttle. For today's Space Trivia Night fun fact, there was only one other shuttle mission after this one that flew with a four-person crew, STS-135, the final mission. But we've got a little bit before we get there. Commanding the flight would be our only familiar face of this mission, Paul Weitz. We last saw Weitz crawling around outside of Skylab with Pete Conrad as part of the Skylab 2 crew. This was his second and final flight. Flying in the right seat as pilot was Bo Bobko. Carol Bobko, who went by his nickname Bo, was born on December 23, 1937. Bobko started his career in the Air Force, graduating in the first class of the Air Force Academy and spending four years flying the F-100 and F-105 fighter jets. 
he found his way to the research pilot school at Edwards before the manned orbiting laboratory program scooped him up in 1966. As part of the MOL program, he flew four times on... No, I'm kidding. MOL fell apart, and he joined NASA in 1969. One of his early notable duties saw him corralled into a Skylab mock-up for 56 days, along with fellow astronauts Bob Crippen and William Thornton as part of the Skylab Medical Experiment Altitude Test, which helped pave the way for the success of the Skylab program. This is Bobco's first of three flights. Flying in the back right of the flight deck was Mission Specialist 1, Story Musgrave. Franklin Story Musgrave was born on August 19, 1935, in Boston, Massachusetts. Musgrave has one of these biographies that is almost exhausting just to read, let alone live, and really makes you wonder how he did it. After dropping out of high school, he joined the Marines, completing a GED while serving. Over the years, he went on to pick up a bachelor's degree in mathematics and statistics, an MBA in operations analysis and computer programming, a bachelor's degree in chemistry, an MD, yes, he's a doctor on top of all this, a master's in physiology and biophysics, and a master's in literature. And somehow through all of that, he managed to keep up with a long list of hobbies, including chess, flying, gardening, literary criticism, microcomputers, parachuting, photography, reading, running, scuba diving, and soaring. And if all that wasn't enough, he's got seven kids. Musgrave joined NASA in 1967 as part of the second group of scientist astronauts and, among other things, helped to develop the shuttle spacesuit. This was his first of six flights. And last but not least, also flying on the flight deck was Mission Specialist 2, Don Peterson. Donald Peterson was born on October 22, 1933, in Winona, Mississippi. After graduating from West Point, he joined up with the Air Force, becoming a flight instructor and fighter pilot. He earned a master's degree in nuclear engineering with an eye towards joining a research program focused on nuclear-powered aircraft. That program didn't really pan out, so he moved on to the manned orbiting laboratory. Whoops. He landed at NASA in 1969. This is his first and only spaceflight. The main two tasks for STS-6 were the deployment of the Tedris A spacecraft and an EVA to evaluate the new shuttle spacesuits. We've talked a little bit about Tedris already, but this is a really important system and will make up a significant number of early shuttle payloads, so let's get into it again. This sometimes comes as a surprise to people who, well, haven't heard this podcast, but for the early space program, contact with the ground wasn't really all that common. A spacecraft in low Earth orbit passes across the horizon in a matter of minutes, which means that's all the time it gets to talk to any given antenna on the ground. This is sort of a goofy visualization, but imagine putting your eye about a centimeter away from a globe. How much of the world can you see? Not all that much. Add in the cost of building ground stations, physically inhospitable land, politically inhospitable land, and the ocean, and you end up with most of the globe being out of comm range. This lack of communication with the ground is both inconvenient and dangerous. Trying to troubleshoot a difficult task in bursts that are only a few minutes long is annoying and prone to errors. But there are also scary situations like Gemini 8, where an emergency can arise outside of a communications pass. Armstrong and Scott solved their stuck thruster problem on their own, but maybe if mission control were in the loop, the situation wouldn't have been nearly as dire, and the full mission could have been completed. The solution to this problem was to place a constellation of communication relay satellites in geostationary orbit, the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRIS. We talked about geostationary orbit last time, so I won't bore you by repeating all of the details, but just remember that a spacecraft in such an orbit appears to hover about 35,000 kilometers above a point on the equator. Unlike the limited view of a single antenna on the ground, an antenna on a satellite in geostationary orbit can see almost an entire hemisphere of the Earth all at once. So even with just a single geostationary relay satellite, suddenly half of the shuttle's orbit will be in communications range. By the way, if this sounds sort of familiar, it's because comms on the Apollo-Soyuz test project were greatly enhanced by the experimental geostationary comsat ATS-6, which provided contact for a whole hemisphere. <laughs> 
With three such satellites positioned around the geostationary ring in a giant equilateral triangle, you can basically talk to anything in low Earth orbit whenever you like, as long as you've got the bandwidth. So that's exactly what NASA planned to do. We'll be hearing a lot about TDRS for basically the rest of the series, but for now we'll just focus on TDRS A, the first satellite in the system. I'll tell you a little more about it once we get into orbit. The second major objective was to complete the shuttle's first EVA. What was supposed to take place on STS-5 instead became a somewhat hastily planned spacewalk added to STS-6. For Story Musgrave, this was no big deal since he played a big part in the design of the new suits. For Don Peterson, he was literally thrown into the deep end as he got to work in the neutral buoyancy lab in Houston. Even simple EVAs can take a large amount of training and practice, but this was a pretty easy one. I sort of view it almost like Ed White's little romp outside of Gemini 4. All the crew had to do was hop outside and try out some lights, cables, tools, tethers, winches, and other stuff like that. Nothing was critical, so if anything went wrong, it would be fine to just pop back inside. Okay, that was kind of a lot of preamble before the launch, but it's actually sort of appropriate. That's because the launch was supposed to be 74 days earlier, but kept getting kicked back in a series of delays that would be pretty funny if they weren't so time-consuming and aggravating. Though with a new orbiter, some bugs were to be expected, I suppose. On December 18, 1982, Challenger was out on the pad for flight readiness firing. It fired all three main engines for 20 seconds so that engineers can get an idea of how they were performing. The answer ended up being not so great. There was a gaseous hydrogen leak somewhere in the back of the orbiter. If you've never seen a photo of the guts of the space shuttle main engine, fire up your image search engine of choice and take a look. Only then will you appreciate just how much of a hassle it was to find a small leak in the massive tangle of pipes and cables created by three SSMEs jammed into the back of an orbiter. While the hunt continued, Tedris A was placed in Challenger's payload bay. They probably regretted that, because by January 7th, the propulsion guys decided that they needed a second test firing, this time with more instrumentation, to help pinpoint the source of the leak. So out Tedris A went, back to the vertical processing facility. On January 25th, the engines were fired again, and eventually the leak was found on engine number one's main combustion chamber coolant outlet manifold, which I'm pretty sure is NASA speak for pipe. On February 4th, Tedris A came back out to the pad, once again safely nestled in Challenger's payload bay. Except, whoops, on the last day of February, a storm kicked up winds strong enough to force some dust through the payload changeout room seals, covering the commsat with grime. Tedris A was once again removed from the shuttle, and folks from Goddard, who run the Tedris program, had to carefully clean the spacecraft, which I'm sure they were thrilled about. Meanwhile, when the replacement main engine arrived, they found a problem with it and had to replace the replacement. And if that wasn't enough, further checks of engines 2 and 3 were performed, and some minor cracks were found, requiring the engines to be removed and repaired. I think it's easy to hear a story like this and wonder, how could an organization like NASA make so many mistakes? But I think that'd be the wrong lesson to draw. I see it more as... It's a good thing that NASA's procedures allowed them to catch so many mistakes. I think it just speaks to the unbelievable complexity of the overall system, and the meticulousness of the tests and verification procedures. I'm not saying that there's no problem and that everyone deserves a pass, but I am saying that as Gene Kranz put it, spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. In any case, Once the pre-launch delays were sorted out, the actual countdown went nice and smoothly. Challenger lifted off right at the start of the launch window at 1.30pm on April 4th, 1983. And perhaps it lifted off with a little more pep than usual, though I haven't actually run the numbers on that, because Challenger not only carried a new lighter weight external tank and lighter weight SRBs, but was running the main engines at 104% of their rated thrust. This seems sort of weird at first, but basically it means that the propulsion engineers made the engines better. And rather than always say 100%, but from this date to this date, or with this type of engine, all the flights are compared against the original thrust level that set the baseline. So 104% it is. After an uneventful ascent, 
Challenger was on its way. And 10 hours after lifting off, it was time to send Tedris A on its way. The payload would be catching a ride to geostationary orbit on an inertial upper stage, or IUS. We've got quite a few IUS flights coming up, so I'll save the detailed description. But just briefly, it was similar in concept to the PAMD from last episode, with multiple solid rockets pushing the payload up to the lofty heights of the geostationary ring. Tedris A was rotated to the proper angle, popped off of the launch cradle, and gently drifted away from Challenger. Once Challenger was at a safe distance, the IUS fired up and Tedris A began its long ride uphill. Unfortunately, the ride was a little longer than expected because one of the stages in the IUS cut out early, leaving Tedris A in a wonky orbit woefully short of its goal. In a stroke of good luck, Tedris A was originally envisioned as hosting commercial payloads as well as government, so brought along some extra station-keeping fuel. The commercial thing didn't work out, but it did mean that the spacecraft had more fuel for its small maneuvering thrusters than it would have normally. As part of a lengthy orbit-raising campaign, the fine folks at the Goddard Space Flight Center planned and executed 39 maneuvers, eventually allowing the 2,300-kilogram spacecraft to enter its slot in the Geo Ring and take on its operational name, Tedris-1. When fully deployed, the spacecraft was pretty big, with a bunch of smaller antennas, two 16-foot-wide circular antennas that look like the back of Crow T. Robot's head, and measuring almost 60 feet across when including the solar array. Tedris operates in bent pipe mode, which means rather than doing any onboard processing, the satellite just takes the signal it gets and immediately beams it down to the relevant ground station. If the ground station happens to be at White Sands, then it's all done. Just do a little post-processing on the ground using customer equipment and complete the routing over typical terrestrial data networks. Other ground stations first route the signal to White Sands since it serves as a hub for the whole system. It's pretty neat and incredibly useful. By the way, my home Wi-Fi network is called, you guessed it, Tedris. Despite the large amount of extra fuel used to limp into orbit, Tedris 1 nearly outlived the entire shuttle program. It remained in service until October 2009, a whopping 26 years after launch. A few days after deploying Tedris A, it was time to take the new spacesuits out for a walk. This next generation of spacesuit was known as the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU, and is close to what's still in use to this day. Compared to the stuff used in Apollo, the EMU is fairly bulky since it's only designed for use in a microgravity environment. The first part of a shuttle EVA is pretty boring. In order to prevent nitrogen bubbles from forming in their blood, the EVA crew spends about three and a half hours hanging out in the airlock, slowly transitioning from the typical shuttle cabin pressure to the lower pressure of the EMU. Low pressure in the suit is desirable because the higher the pressure, the more the astronaut has to fight against the natural tendency of the suit to return to its resting state. Again, think of something like the suit's arm as a cylindrical balloon. If you bend the balloon, it wants to snap back into place. Over the course of a multi-hour EVA, that can get really tiring. It is for that reason that the EMU was kept at 4.3 PSI of pressure. And since the shuttle cabin is kept at sea level, around 15 PSI, a lengthy pre-breathing exercise is required. And actually, it didn't really occur to me until I was writing this how it's sort of strange that the shuttle was kept at 15 PSI. I mean, passenger jets go down to like 11 or 12 PSI, so what's the deal with the extra pressure? A mystery for another day, I suppose. The main objective for this EVA was, as the mission plan put it, simulated EVA tasks, which I found to be pretty funny since they're done on an actual EVA. So I guess they're authentic simulated EVA tasks. It's not totally far off, though, since this EVA was hardly ambitious. Musgrave and Peterson came out of the airlock, clipped into cables that run the length of the payload bay, and just sort of puttered around. They checked that the lights worked and that they could hear each other clearly over the radio and that the new tools could be handled with the new gloves. Stuff like that. They also practiced a contingency measure that could be used in the future. Before deploying Tedris A, its launch cradle was elevated to a specific angle. Before heading home, the cradle needed to be returned to its original position. This could be done from the crew cabin at the press of a button, 
but in case of failure, the cradle also had support for an EVA crew to manually winch it back in place, which is what they did. While cranking the cradle down, Peterson found himself fighting against the inevitable equal and opposite reaction, which resulted in him sort of kicking his legs out. After a bit of this, an alarm sounded in his suit, a high oxygen use alarm. I believe this can mean that Peterson was just overexerting himself and breathing too hard, but in this case it meant that a minor leak had formed around his waist due to the waist ring sliding back and forth during the kicking. By the time Musgrave came over to take a look, the leak had resolved itself. The EVA crew decided not to tell the ground, who wasn't in contact at the moment anyway, since it wasn't a critical problem and they could still get into the airlock pretty quickly if it recurred. But when mission controllers did see the alarm on the downlink data after the spacewalk, they weren't too thrilled, but there wasn't really much they could do at that point. The minor leak problem remained a mystery for several years until it was accidentally replicated on the ground by astronaut Kathy Sullivan, allowing engineers to resolve the issue. When I was reading about the spacewalk in the official documentation, I found a sentence so ridiculous that I just had to share it all with you verbatim. Well, Verbatim with one unfamiliar acronym translated. Quote, The payload bay lighting conditions, when illuminated from direct and indirect solar radiation, showed that it was difficult, but did not prohibit the crewmen from reading the display and control module's LED displays. Direct and indirect solar radiation? Unless I'm missing something, which is always a likely possibility, that is NASA speak for sunlight. Direct and indirect solar radiation. After four hours and 17 minutes outside, Musgrave and Peterson clambered back into the airlock after a successful EVA. Other than attending to the usual slew of minor experiments, there was nothing left to do on Challenger's first flight. With the EVA behind them and 17,000 kilograms of payload now in a higher orbit, the mission was a success. The crew strapped back into their seats, kicked off the deorbit burn, and waited for the windshields to get that nice pink glow that meant they were heading home. Once again, the landing would be at Edwards Air Force Base, but with one extra enhancement, a heads-up display. A heads-up display, or HUD, is a system that allows a pilot to easily view a bunch of relevant information while still looking forward out the window and seeing where they're going. It allows them to keep their head up. Get it? Text and graphics containing stuff like airspeed, orientation, and altitude appears on top of the view out the window. And by using fancy lenses and stuff, the pilots can still keep their eyes focused in the distance with the overlay still remaining clear. That way they don't have to constantly refocus their eyes near and far, near and far. Columbia would later get a HUD of its own, but it was Challenger that introduced it to the orbiter fleet. Challenger touched down after 5 days, 23 minutes, and 42 seconds, committing its first mission to the history books. Next time, Challenger flies again, carrying a crew of five on STS-7. And finally, finally, with this next mission, using the term manned with NASA spaceflight, transforms from archaic and sexist to just plain inaccurate. That's because Mission Specialist 2 and the flight's robot arm expert is Sally Ride. America's first woman astronaut. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>